Hi, everybody. This is Heather Lockyer with Lasting Conversations, and we are in studio today. This is an amazing setup. I've been on the road and on Zooms for quite a bit of episodes, so it's just amazing to be here. And today, we were, are with the gentleman of the back nine. We're with Dennis Williams and Josh Mora. Yeah. And... Thank you for being here. And we're actually collaborating today because they have their own show. So we're we're tag teaming. They're on my show. I'll be on their show. So welcome, guys. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank so you for having us. So thrilled to have, uh, have you invite us on. Thanks. It's so great. It's so fun. And tell me about the back nine. It's a golf reference. And what's very cool, as I just had my birthday, uh, ending my year 60 and now 61 yesterday, um, and you guys are gentlemen of a certain age, and we've all been around a few blocks. So tell us about a back nine and where it is that you're going philosophically with what you're doing with your show. Sure. Well, first of all, Heather, happy birthday. Thank Thrilled you. Thrilled to be here on your Thank, birthday. Thanks. Um, so the back nine is, for people who don't play golf, it's a golf metaphor, right? That that you play 18 holes. There is a front nine, the first nine. Usually in, in the U.S., that means you come back to the clubhouse after nine holes. And then there is a second nine. So the metaphor is when you're on the back nine of life, you are in the second half of life. And I think we all, we approach this from the standpoint of men getting to that point in life where we have, you know, there's the, the whole midlife crisis. Well, there isn't a crisis. It doesn't have to be. But there are certainly times where we kind of reconsider what it is that we're getting out of life at that point. Maybe it's that our kids are leaving the house to go to college or they're still in high school and about to uh, or we're having you are halfway through our careers and we're thinking about, well, what haven't I accomplished yet? What do I want to do as we start to think about, well, we may be at that time of life where we should start working on those goals and those objectives. Right. And so that's what we kind of approach on our podcast, the issues that we face and confront, the challenges, challenges that we want to undertake, and the things that we can accomplish on the back nine of life. That's really cool. And I know you have a really great lineup of people that, that delve into all kinds of great topics. So what is it that you feel is bringing into the show, The Back Nine? And how did you guys come to doing a podcast from your careers? Well, we were both uh, broadcast journalists uh, for the first part of our career. We have amazingly similar backgrounds. We went to very, very small colleges um, Hamilton College and Amherst College, if you don't know, they're called NESCAC schools. They're called small Ivies. So we both went to, he was an English major, I was a history major. And then we both ended up in broadcast TV in Buffalo. We'll cut to the chase here. Mm -hmm. We were both sportscasters uh, for almost 20 years apiece and have had, had other, other iterations of our careers since then. Uh, so we've always been around microphones. We've interviewed a lot of people over the years. So what happened really was uh, was during COVID. He and I were going through a lot of different things at the same time. Uh, we both went through divorces at the same time, um, being out there in the dating world again. We found ourselves, you know, because you weren't seeing anybody or talking to anybody, spending a lot of time on Zoom and discussing this. And we were like, this is some pretty deep stuff that we should be sharing with other people. We know what we're doing, talking to each other, and we helped each other out of like difficult situations and things like that. And and, and we just realized that this this could be a pretty good podcast. Nobody's really doing this, delving into guys talking about, you know, feelings and certain circumstances in their lives and things that are happening to them and um, all of the things that, um, you know, that are a little different and, and making that okay. Uh, so that was where it came from. And then um, we, to be honest with you, we're so old school, we had to find this studio. So... You know, you talked about being on Zoom and you being back in a studio. Like, we have to be. I mean, he comes in from Orlando. We're here in Delray Beach. We're, we're really old school. You know, he still says taping on episodes. So do I. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, we're taping. We're, we're, taping. <laughs> we're in the, it's the tape, vernacular. Yeah. Ta tape's been over for 20 years. But, um, yeah, so it's uh, it, it, it's been great. I mean, I think us sitting across from each other in the studio. But it really, we, we set out to have it not be about us, to have it be about bringing on great guests and having you be able to take away two or three really cool things from those guests. And we've had great men, great women, um, a lot of people that come from our broadcast background, some celebrities. Uh, yeah, it's just been, it, it, it's it really fun for us to get together and scout out the next seasons, the next guests, the next, who's going to get out on, what's right. going to, what's the topic going to be? Like we really, and we're usually in sync on all of that, on, on who we want to have on. And 
what kind of stories we want to tell. Because at our core as broadcast journalists, we're storytellers. So we kind of want each episode to tell a story. And I feel like we do that for the most part. I think too, Dennis, and, and, you know, Heather, I appreciate the question a lot. You know, we, we, we wanted to get into a position as, as Dennis was describing, you know, that we were all kind of alone during the pandemic. And this was a way for us to communicate at the time Dennis was living in California. We've obviously been, you know, good friends for over 25 sure. years. It was a way for us to stay in touch. And we, we were, were alone and soul searching. That's yes. the, that's yeah. the yeah, common yeah, nugget real- there. We were all in this place of, uh, okay, now what? That's right. right. And for a lot of men who are going through these kinds of issues already, right. there was a real uh, a danger of getting into a downward spiral, of yes. feeling like you are alone and, and that being amplified in the pandemic. Right. And so the whole idea of the podcast is to get men feeling comfortable about talking about things that they don't normally talk about. And for our audience to feel like they are participating in that conversation. And it's interesting that a lot of our audience has been has been women because mm-hmm. they don't get to hear those. To the extent that men do talk about those things, we don't talk about those things in front of women. So they get to listen in and, and be kind of voyeurs into that. And to Dennis's point about some of the guests, we've had a lot of great women who have talked about, I think of a couple of episodes. One was about a woman who has an amazing journey about being a single mom and raising three girls together. And so for for the, the men in our audience, how can we be better supporters, either as co-parents or as supporting single moms that we might date or find in the workplace. Uh, We had another person talk about overcoming uh, a a second DUI and how that scared him straight into sobriety and what he's done with that second chance after he served some time for that. So there have been some really revealing stories where people have been um, wonderfully open to being vulnerable with us and talking about these things and hopefully making that available to our audience. That's beautiful. And that's why we mesh. We've met a few times and this show is all about getting to the heart of things. And I really appreciate the male perspectives as a matter of fact, and because everything can lean one way or to the next, you know, they're a bunch of bitches or they're a bunch of assholes. And this is common ground and that your guests, you know, talking about being girl dads and having that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had Ben Curtis on your show yet. Um, our producer uh, put me in contact. He works with men, and and to have that comfortability, comfortability of having dudes, dudes in your corner in ways that perhaps they never have before. So he'd be a great guest too. I'll just play, make that plug <laughs> yeah, for you. Yeah. Um, so to have the male perspective and to accommodate and include the female perspective as well, because. We are all in this together. So that's really the fun part of both of our shows. And I really appreciate both of you doing that. Um, Have you had some amazing moments? And I will circle back to these chapters. And I like how your whole show is split up in these golf metaphors. The first, the beginning, and then the other chapters Mm -hmm. by the time you get to your 18th hole. So tell us more about that. Well, I mean, I think what we do is is we try to like have the season have a little bit of an arc, right? And and have 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 like I said earlier, some stories to each each episode. Um, yeah, I would I would say that um, you know, in what you were talking to the metaphor of the front nine is like early in the front nine, you know, you're just getting your feet under you, you're just trying to figure out, you know, what you're gonna do. You start to realize one of, one of the most compelling things we had in the first season was your uh, resume goals is the front nine and mm-hmm. your eulogy goals is the back nine. You want to know what your legacy is going to be. And that theme has come up time and time again. Uh, what is my legacy? What am I leaving behind? The front nine, you're just worried about the job, how much money you're making, wh- you know, who you're hanging out with, all those kinds of things, right? The back nine, you start to realize, how, ma- how are people going to remember me? Mm-hmm. You know, what are they going to say? How many people are going to be, you know, at my funeral? I mean, I had to be more of them. Like, who's going to go and who's going to care, Right. And uh, what is your legacy? So I think that that's kind of the arc. You you, you kind of gr- gradually make your way towards trying to figure out what that legacy looks like. That that was a um, a topic brought up by a guy named John Callahan, mm-hmm. who was in episode twelve of our first season, and we number the episodes ten through eighteen because it's the back nine. Perfect. Um, and and his story stemmed from his experience. He was actually in attendance at the Route ninety six concert in Las Vegas when the guy was at the top of Mandalay Bay and started opening fire. Oh, and so he was sitting there dodging bullets, thinking, if I die now, what? how am I going to be remembered? I mean, yes, I love my, my wife and kids are going to love me, but have I done the things that I'm, I would be proud of? And his answer was no, even though he had been incredibly successful. And then it was a theme that was repeated in season two, episode 16. One of our guests is the producer of the movie Pretty Woman mm-hmm. and other movies. And he 
totally separately of his own volition brought up kind of the same notion of being halfway through his life and thinking, I'm not doing the things that are making me proud of what I'm doing. Even though I like what I have done, sure. there's more there and I want to make that shift. This is amazing. And I'm immediately in one way going to the talking heads with David Burns old video, Stop Making Sense. You know, how did I get here? Yeah. And he's doing this on his arm where it, it's almost like you're slicing, you have different iterations of your life, but how, what is making sense and what do I need to do to pivot and maybe make a reverse change or see what else is next. And these moments are very, very interesting. Um, I had a very, and sometimes they're just in our face. That's so remarkable. Just last week I was at a diner and I sat over in a corner and there was a young woman, I can call her a girl, but a young woman and we got to talking and the depth of our conversation just started going there. And to make a very long story short, I was thinking in my head, oh my goodness, am I talking to my 22-year-old self? Because she's 22. Mm -hmm. She bursts into tears and says, I think I'm getting wisdom from my older version self. And wow. we, we just wow. had this moment <clears throat> because it was so true that I could recognize what I was offering was from, I'm in my, I'm actually going to call it the middle nine because we, we have another 60 years. So it, this is, we really are, we have all extra chapters. Maybe golf will continue to the 36th round. <laughs> so that I could be imbuing things that I have learned from my own holy shit moments and the messengers and, and mentors along the way in therapy or whatever else. And that she so was hungry to know it's okay to make some massive, massive changes, especially if people aren't going to want you to do it. So this was somehow it all ties into what your show is about when we come to these moments in our life that continue and you continue with your chapter, you go to the next hole, you go to the next round. Maybe you play a whole nother game the same day, a double header, I'll start some baseball. So all these things and you guys bring really juicy people that are open to share these things. Well, I think that the, what that young lady did showed about herself, which is another common theme for us, is she showed you that she was curious. She yes. was curious about you. Yes. She was asking you questions. It wasn't just about her. Yep. She, you know, I'm sure she was, you know, and that's why you guys are able to have that sort of conversation. So one of the, you know, overwhelming themes, um, and it seems basic, but it's just a big part of what we're talking about is it being curious at this age, right? right. Um, so it's it's profound that somebody that young is 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 asking you questions about about things in the future and and, and stuff like that. I I think that is is such a critical thing to be on the back nine. And if you think about it, a podcast listener is curious, right? They're they're exploring different subject matters. Um, maybe in this day and age they're like me and they can't read, <laughs> so they, or they they can't concentrate long enough to actually read a book, so they want to listen to things. So. Um, so I think that's 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 huge. I mean, I think everybody can find there's so much information out there now, too, right. um, that that being curious is such an important part of, of the back nine. I want to pick up on something else, Heather, and that was from your perspective and point of view on that conversation, right. which is the joy of mentoring. Yes. Right. And and I think that's something that all of us, as we search for our legacy, we want to try to imbue that legacy in as many people as possible. If we if we're proud of what we've done or to help other people avoid the same mistakes that we did or provide that perspective. And, you know, we can do that with our own kids, mm -hmm. but our relationships with our own kids is wonderful and as deep and complex as they are. There are certain, you know, resentments, dad. I mean, how many times I've heard that right, right from my girls, but you know, and I find sometimes it's easier. People are more open to listening when it's not, you don't have all of those other, Always. uh, uh you know, complexities within that relationship. Right. When it's not your closest people, you can That's hear, right. hear it from a coach, from a teacher, from the person next door. That's right? exactly right. Yeah. And, and so, so what I've tried to do for my own parenting is pivot my, my daughters and go listen to other people, right? Here's right. someone else I think you can, you can find. And you may hear what I said, you may hear a, a totally different opinion and that's, and that's fine. Right. But I do think that there's something about wanting to reconnect and wanting to stay vital and wanting to stay relevant in today's world with the generations that are coming up. I think that's so true. And what other fresh nuggets from your own shows or from your 
uh, circumstance that would have this sort of flow and what it is that you're doing, that this is jazzing you um, and your kids are older now and things, all that good stuff, that this is kind of a, a great time to create and recreate things professionally, personally. Well, it's interesting that you phrase it that way, Heather. The, the one that immediately jumps to mind was our last episode of season one with a woman named Carol Negrelli, who we both knew. who She was in the media with us at the same time in Buffalo and Dennis is throwing me killer looks like you just stole mine. I don't know if it, <laughs> but, but, but she, she, um, that's what friends do. She was, she, uh, uh, got divorced, married somebody uh, who was also in the business, followed, gave up her career to follow his, but she was done with the career and rediscovered, uh, her love of playing music. She had played the, the cello when she was a girl and when she was in high school and had put it aside and hadn't picked it up in, you know, decades. And the free space allowed her to do that and discover the joy of creating, in this case, creating music. Right. We're creating a podcast. You're creating a podcast. It's a different, it's a different, you know, art of a, of a sort. But, and now she's playing in uh, symphony orchestras in Nebraska, which is where they live. And so I forget if it's the Nebraska Symphony Orchestra, the Omaha, a big deal, right? I mean, she's obviously very, very talented, yeah. but for her, it's all uh, it's all stemmed from rediscovering a passion that she had put aside a long time ago. Yep. And I, and so that is something that I, I take away. Find what those are. They may be they may be something that you buried a long time ago. They may be something that you're discovering for the first time. Right. It might be it might be hiking or paddleboarding or something you've never done. It might be, you know, uh, shooting hoops or running or swimming or playing the cello. Right. And, and yeah, I mean, that's so important. The other thing is about Carol, and I'll just do an aside here, is that here's somebody I hadn't spoken with in 20 years, right? And that's what this show has done so much for us. It's allowed us to really reconnect with people from all walks of life in our past that um, that are just terrific, like terrific old friends. And, and, and we talk about former athletes we want to have on the yeah. show, which is great. And we're, we're projecting ahead to, oh, we can get that former NFL player right before football season. Let's do that because he'll be great. Um, so we're thinking about those kinds of things now, too. I'll give you one episode that really literally profoundly helped me at, at the time the episode launched. Mm -hmm. So um, our fifth episode of season one. So it's 14th hole? 14th hole, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm here for the math. <laughs> um, so so that, that episode, a good friend of mine from college, Jim Rushton, was on that episode. And he has a completely different path than, than I had, even though we had similar backgrounds. He was married to his career for a long, long time uh, and, and sacrificed having a family until very recently. So here he is, uh, 53 years old with a uh, four-year-old and a two-year-old, some, somewhere in that range, like crazy, Four crazy year old young. and a two-year-old at 53. Yeah. Right. My God. So, and, and he still has very high power jobs. He's still carrying like a lot of weight on him for these, for this career. His career hasn't just stopped. So what he, what he said was he, he had read some things about and trained himself to compartmentalize. And sometimes that's a word that doesn't, doesn't have a good connotation. Right. But if you're a type A personality, and, and I have a lot of these traits of like not being able to focus on more than one thing, um, th that, um, it's such an important word, right? So being able to take a moment to put everything else aside and focus on that moment that you're in and be present. So compartmentalize, put the work away and focus. So right after that episode, right when it launched, I went on a cruise with my family right after Christmas. And I had moments on that cruise where I would normally have been checking, even on a cruise, you can check your yeah. work email, you can do everything now, they have perfect Wi-Fi. So I was like, I literally would leave my phone in the room. I was focused on my parents. I was focused on my sister and her kids and my fiance. I was, I became more present on that trip and it wouldn't have happened had we not had that episode. So, um, am, am, have I perfected it yet? The compartmentalizing? Nope. <laughs> but, I'm, <laughs> but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. No, but that's amazing. And that's where, and I usually say each one, reach one or teach one. And, and I've had those moments too, where in the middle of the show, we can both have get the goosebump moments or the tearful moment because something has just landed. Um, and there's something for us behind these microphones at the same time as what's meant out for the, for the collective. So I appreciate that you're just saying that. Um, 
the the phrase that keeps coming to mind in in these conversations that you guys especially are having is now going back to talk to the your old friends or colleagues as grown ass adults <laughs> right so and and part of that was that focus or that race and collectively when you think that you're in your 20s and you're supposed to be grinding and hustling and this and this and this and the, of course the new generation is saying mm, not necessarily that's a different show but <laughs> but when we were growing up, that was it. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to do that. For the guys, it was usually about the providing and the career and career. Women, yes, the career, career, and also um, TikTok, TikTok, yeah. if you're having a kid and who's the right guy. And we were all searching who's our love and all of these things. So now to come to a different space as grown ass adults, are you finding that the very conversations that you're having with old colleagues, old friends are from a whole different vantage point. A thousand percent. Yeah. I, you know, Heather, I think both of us have, Dennis and I have lives that are busy, right? But the podcast is not the only thing that we do. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, speaking just for me, that there is nothing that I'm doing in my life that feels more aligned with my true self and my spiritual self than doing this podcast. Yep. Yeah, I agree with that too. And, and I think... Um, what most it's amazing to me how we said this earlier but how vulnerable people are and how willing they are to show their scars um that's to me that's like what life is about it's about if you're willing to talk about your scars uh you know you've made made it somewhere and and that's what we're seeing we're seeing these people a lot of them you know mark in particular the person who had the duis who's mm -hmm. a public figure you know, I thought he might not want to do this like mm -hmm. again and bring it all up again. And he couldn't have been more gracious and happy to to be on the show. And and it's one after another. And they're and they're talking about really difficult stuff and 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 not not always complimentary stuff either right. for the for their lives. Um, so so I, I I've been amazed that we, we've had zero no's. You know, everybody we've asked has wanted to be on the show um, and not hidden from their past or what they want to talk about. And every person has. A great story to tell and they're all different so um again i just come back to the stories there's yeah. so many good ones and i think we're giving them a safe space to tell those stories they and feel very it. comfortable that's there exactly so it's a it. really interesting listen because of that yeah, yeah. Th you're so true um the safe place to be vulnerable and to be human that's mine i'm team human and um i don't know about you guys but you get um approached with so and so wants to be on your show sure but is that nothing but a sales pitch and that for me to be the honor of being in the chair means that you're going to come in as a human, that you have something uh, of more depth versus I have a book to, to sell you, right? Because well, there's a million shows for that. Yeah. I don't well, know I would, if you guys are fielding those inquiries also. I don't think we would even bother with that because Correct. we're trying to create a community. Um, yes. And unless there's a story that, that aligns with what we're trying to do, then, yep. then I don't think there's any possibility. We, we would never do that. We... <laughs> We talked about doing a show with no sponsors in it. That's how much we wanted to just create a community. I mean, it's not really realistic, but um, but it, you know, it's it's one of those things where you know, you know, Facebook didn't put any ads on their platform or have any paid ads for years right. because they wanted to create a massive community, right? Um, you know, lots of social media companies have have tried that that formula. So, you know, there is something to be said for that. Like, I mean, really, that's what we're trying to do. So, where do you see your next? nine, your next season, your next iteration? Do you see more TV cameras or it's, I'm going to ratchet that back because we're all in a, like a little step at a time, stepping stones, right? Yeah, we, we do. And we do have a video component now. I mean, as yeah. you know, these are all, all done on Zoom That's and we, right. we do publish the Zooms on, on YouTube. Yep, find us on YouTube. Uh, yes. And yeah. we would like to also, you know, be on more of a set at some point, at least experiment with what that looks like. Right. Um, so, so there's that. And then the guest, you know, we continue to expand. You know, the, the first season for us was very much about people that we knew personally and had known for a long time, kind of creating the expectation Season two, which is now entirely recorded, has been a, a, a variety. Some things that have been more topical. We mentioned the brave single moms. Have, we've had a couple of of celebrities. Uh, uh, you know, one uh, uh, we mentioned the Hollywood producer. Mm -hmm. We have another guy who's producing uh, one of the top TV shows. The head writer and co creator of one of the top TV shows on HBO Max right now. Um, and then in season three, I think we feel like expanding that. We we have a, a balance of. People we've known, mm -hmm. some people for the first time who are really new to us, 
some things that are going to be topics, fitness on the back nine, spiritual connection on the back nine, um, and somewhere we have a couple of, of celebrities that are already booked that I think will be very, very interesting to our audience. That's great. So I'll go ahead and ask, because um, I don't want to shorten the show too much here, is from your male perspective, from your dad perspective, from your life perspective as the males, what are you saying, what are you feeling that people really should know, kind of a, a man-to-man moment? Well, that's a good one. Because, you know, I think, and I'm not a golfer, but I hear tell that a lot of conversations, a lot of stuff happens out on these golf courses. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, the women have a coffee clutch or they've had sewing circles or they tend to be a little more social and can chat away or find the vulnerable places. Where is it from the male perspectives, especially without having that go-go career that that's eating your life up? Where are people from the guy perspective, having these moments together so they feel that they're in community. Yeah, well, that, I think that's part of the construct, right? I mean, right. To, to the extent that guys open up, it tends to be after we've spent that kind of time together, which right. is why we do it on the 19th hole. We're having a beer after a round of golf, and we might say, tell me about that investment that you're in, or how did you find that? Or, right. uh, hey, are you still dating that brunette that you were dating three months ago, whatever it might be. Um, and, and, and so I think what we're trying to create is for men to understand not only is it okay to release these feelings or to talk about these, even if you don't want to necessarily talk about how you feel about it, but just to talk about them. Sure. It's necessary. It's how you get to a, a deeper connection. If you really want more out of life, this is kind of what you've got to do. Be grounded. It, be grounded in your masculinity, right? It is actually a masculine thing to be able to talk about these things because it comes from a place of inner awareness and, and groundedness right. um, as opposed to how we sometimes see masculinity uh, portrayed, deployed, you know, with, with you know, uh, bluster and bloviation and that kind of thing. Calm, understanding, patience, really inquiring about the people who are around you and being, and being curious on a personal level, um, and, you know, not just on an experiential level. Um, and I think that's what we've we've created so far on the back nine. And I think also, too, you guys talked about uh, being mentors and how important that is for a younger generation or other people. That's a good point. I think we're still looking for mentors, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so if I'm sitting there, um, you know, after a round of golf and, and maybe somebody's the same age, maybe they're a little older. I, I may be getting a lot of advice from them. You know, still, there's still there's still a lot for me to learn and mm-hmm. there's still a lot of of. of people that I can talk to that can mentor me about, about different things. So, so I'm, I'm constantly in that phase is trying to listen to people. I think that's, if I was going to tell um, men anything right now, just be better listeners. We aren't at our core. We're always like at- attacking and talking and da, 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 da. That's how I feel anyways. And, and um, you know, I've, I've tried to take the practice of, of, of being a better listener. Um, and I think that's important, whether you're dealing with other men or you're dealing with women in your life or you're trying, this is one of our shows, if you're trying to date, um, be the listener. You're, she does, she'll let you know if she wants to know all about you. She'll yeah. let you know. But what you should be trying to do is learn as much about her as possible on that first date. So, um, you know, we, we kind of talked about that at the, at the pod fest, um, you know, what, what to do in those situations. Hopefully you're finding guys that, that will listen to you because that's the key. Yeah, we'll get to that part. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's for our we'll show. Get, yeah. we'll I love that, it. We'll this is it. But I am with guys that are doing that. Right? That's great. And and when I just recently traveled and another serendipitous moment, there was a gentleman having business in town and we didn't call it a date, but I recognized I'm having a great conversation with a very nice guy. We're just talking about stuff. So without having it feel like a setup of and now I'm on a date, we'll we'll talk about it on your show. Okay. You can have me on your show. Okay. But um that the notion of what the relationship can look like on another chapter, especially mm-hmm. in the old, you know, done me wrong chapters. But, um, and I guess going back to the kids now, how old are your, your kids? And do you have step iterations of family as well? So, that's a whole nother navigation. Yeah, We each have two daughters that are three years apart. Yeah. My oldest and his youngest are what, six weeks apart, eight weeks apart? Yeah. Roughly, mine's a little older. So I have the youngest. She's still in college. The other three are all are all out. Okay. Um, with steps, um, I know my girlfriend has three kids, one who's in college one who, and two in high school, one who's graduating this year. 
Uh, and so one, actually one of our one of our episodes was about blended families yes. and, and how to bring those things together. Um, so that's that's the, yeah. the current status. Yeah. I have a 26 year old and a 23 year old and a fiance who I guess presumably will be the stepmom by the end of the year. Uh, but yeah, every, it, it's a good situation for for us. Um, my girls get along very well with my fiance. So. Um, it hasn't been a big issue. I, you know, I think it's about, again, honesty, being straightforward, um, being around them. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, they're, they're grown women now at 26, 23. So they're going to have their own opinions and, um, and, and be present when they need to be. So I, I think, yeah, I think that, that, that it's been good. They've done a good job. So it's never easy to navigate that part of life, Sure, but, but uh, for the most part, it's gone well. Well, that's great. And and let's not forget, obviously, they have their own chapters. So mm-hmm. they knew daddy as little kids. And then life happened mm-hmm. and whatever careers and all that. And then divorces and all of that. So now are you finding, uh, and I find this with my own kids, at forging re- a new relationship with them as adults. Oh, yeah. So let's touch on that yeah, for we, real we, quick we, as the guys. So we talked about this in an episode, too. So I, I, I actually give dads advice on this a lot, and that is, um, you know, they're, they're always your little girl. Mm-hmm. But at some point, you have to make that transition where they become your friend, and that day is the hardest. And it's not, like, gradual. It's literally overnight. Like, you you, you have this one for, for In my situation, it was almost like a fight with each of them. We didn't fight very much, but it was like, and, and I said, you know what? You think she's still your little girl. You've got to make that transition. And the next time I recognized it with my second one. So it was like literally you flip a switch and you've got to be like, treat them as an adult, treat them as a friend. You're still going to be a parent. You're still going to give them the parental advice and all those things. Don't get me wrong there. But you just can't. They just can't stay in the back of your mind. They're always your little girl. But forward interacting with them, how you are on a day to day basis, how you communicate with them. You have to realize that they're not your little girl, and it is hard. Chokes me up to even talk about it, <laughs> but it is it. it but but you got to do it as, yeah. as a man. You have to do it, and and I'll be honest with you, uh, they'll respect that because yes. well, all all I've ever wanted with my girls was to see some of me and the guys that they end up with. Um, that's and it's not that I don't. It's not like I want them to marry their exact dad, but I want them to see characteristics, values, things that I presented to them in their significant others someday. That's mm-hmm. all I hope for. Yep. But, but he's vain that way. So no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, the, but no, there's no, a good... he's, he's totally right. Yeah. I, I'm going to take it. It was just a joke, but I'm going to take it a slightly different direction while sure. agreeing with everything that he just said, because I do agree with everything he just said, which is, you know, when you're, when you're co-parenting with somebody, when, even when you're in a marriage, you're going to disagree sometimes about what is the best thing to do. You have different values, different yes. upbringings, et cetera. And that becomes more pronounced when you're no longer together, right? right? Suddenly I don't have, if, if I disagreed with something with my ex-wife when she was my wife, we could talk it through and say, what's the best approach together? Now we don't have that, that kind of language. Um, so when, when, like, I have no doubt that my ex-wife loves my daughters with every bone in her body, every fiber of her being, right. I disagree with some, some of the ways in which that then gets deployed. And I'm I know she feels the same way about, about my styles too. So when you disagree and your children might take up one side or the other, especially if they take up the other side, it's really important to put your ego aside Mm -hmm. and either, you know, you don't have to fight about that. You don't have to um, tear down, you know, your your ex-spouse for their belief or whatever. You just have to keep showing up for your kids. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there have certainly been times when I've disagreed with things my kids are doing. And we'll talk about it. And I'll say, this is my position. I understand yours. Okay. We've talked. We've, we agree that we disagree. I'm still here. Right. Period. And we keep showing up for them no matter what. I love all of it. Both of the the blends of what you were just saying. And of course the notion of, and I had my own come to Jesus moments of myself of, of realizing, oh, who am I? It's about that modeling that you were touching on is, am I being the best self for each of my kids. And somehow I'm, I'm landing mostly on my daughter, but my son too, because am I following up in this marriage? Am I saying all of these things are okay? Because I don't want her to go through this too. So all of those moments when you're having to look at, 
oh, am I my best self for my kids? And what are they seeing that I'm not even that I'm not even seeing? But to your point of, oh, wait a second, who is she going to be marrying? And who is he going to be marrying? Am I projecting my best self and showing what a modeled, what a, a good, healthy relationship is looking like? And so there were in the days that I realized, oh, crap, no, it's not looking like that. And that's not what I want for my kids. I don't want to hand them a shit show. Mm-hmm. Right. So well, I, it's up to me to do my own part. I can't be fixer to everybody. Right. But yeah. I liked that that notion of where are we again present um, and let them be their own new people. They're going to have their own journey and find their new people um, who we wish them to love and admire and respect them. We want mutual respect. And I did just watch a, a dad give away his little girl at a wedding on Saturday. And it was beautiful. And his speech was talking about when she was mm-hmm. little and making that transition into now she's a grown woman. And there was just one photo, only a couple of the whole professional, but the photo of he, he did one dance the whole night and it was with her daughter, sure. his daughter. And the look on his face, just looking at his daughter was exactly what you guys were talking about. And, and I will just say from the female perspective, guys get a hard rap. They just do. And some, some ladies like to freeze out the dads. And I don't think that's, that's not healthy at all. So to have these moments, to be a girl dad and a guy's dad, um, now that they're growing into grown-ass adults, um, it, it's a magical time. It can be difficult, but it really is. Who, who do they get to see in us so that they can fly and draw to them the best people for them. Yeah, I, and I think from the parents' perspective, it's recognizing, and especially the dad's perspective, we yeah. can't fix right. anything. At this point, we're not supposed to fix. Right. We need to listen. Yeah. We need to articulate our points of view about why we think they might be doing something that is unhealthy or dangerous or not in their best interests. Right. But in the end, we have to stop. We also have to listen to what, what their perspective is. Right. And trust that if we've done our jobs as parents at any point, and this is not anything that's also fixed, yep. uh, that they'll hear it. And and then we let it go. And, and then we let, let them, go. the yep. way they really become full people right. is not by us controlling them. Correct. It's by us articulating our perspective and then letting them make their decisions. That's it. Yeah. I'll give you one more thought too. And that is, um, you, you, so you sometimes have to navigate with the things that you realize you might not have been taught properly. And what I mean right. by that is, is you know, I, I had a great upbringing, great parents and everything, but there were certain things that, that I'm doing differently. And one of those is, um, is, and we talked about this, is start at yes. You know, a lot of people in your life tell you they will stack the reasons why you can't do something, right? Mm-hmm. And and that's their whole, and, and even if you overcome that, you still had to overcome all the no's. You had to sell through the no's to get to the yes. Um, my, my mantra has been for the last several years, maybe the last decade, and I've tried to instill this in my kids is start at yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can sell me on no later. Okay. I might not always stay at yes. And there might, there might be a lot of reasons not to say it. Yes, but I'm going to start there and then you're going to have to sell me on no instead of starting at no and selling me on yes. And that's probably the number one thing that I've tried to instill in my kids that was not instilled in me that I had to kind of figure out myself. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, um, and I hope that they, and, and they, and I think for the most part, looking at their lives at, at, uh, at 26 and 23, that they are in a big way doing that in, in a big way, they're doing that. So it makes me proud. That's beautiful. Start it. Yes. And that they are the next generation and they have, if we have another 40, 50 some years, they have, they could have another hundred years mm-hmm. realistically. So that's a whole different show. <laughs> we'll yeah. get the quantum physics and <laughs> yep. medicine people. Guys, is there any last nugget that you'd like to share? And of course, where to find you and what else that you guys are doing? Um, you know, I th- this has been great. First of all, thank you so much for having us on. I think you have a, an amazing show and, and we appreciate being in the studio. It's a good feeling, right? Being yeah. in the studio and talking I love like it. this. Yep. Um, but we're grateful. You know, I think I just kind of gave you my mantra to start at yes. I mean, yeah. if I, if you're going to take anything away that I said for the last, you know, half hour or so, 
uh, that would be it. Like try to live your life that way with 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 curiosity um, and starting starting it. Yes, that would be the number one thing. And and uh, hopefully people are you know tuning into your show, downloading and 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 uh, following and and we hope people will follow us too. Yeah, uh, my mine would be show up, right? Participate in your life. Right. I encourage others to participate in your life and participate in others' lives and step into your power. We were we were. We come to this, to the physical world, I don't want to get too woo-woo here, but we come to the physical world with immense possibility and and um, a responsibility to live to our fullest selves. And along the way, as we go through, as we grow up, influences come and cause us to protect and uh, and sometimes to live in fear. Drop that. You know, we've got a very short space of time on this earth. So live into it. Start with yes. You know, step into your power. And uh, you can start that by also not only listening to your podcast, Heather, Mm -hmm. but the back nine. It's the number nine. So it's the back nine. You can find it on Apple, on Spotify, on YouTube, anywhere else you get your podcasts. Um, And we look forward to having you join our community as, as we're thrilled to be a part of yours and grateful for this opportunity to be with you, Heather. Gentlemen. Dennis, Josh, thanks so much. This has really been a lot of fun. Yeah. And we're swinging for the rafters. And this is very cool. And thank you very much. And thanks for listening, everybody. Please remember to like, follow, review, and share this podcast. And yes, you can find Lasting Conversations on YouTube also and in all the listening places. So this is Lasting Conversations. We get to the heart of everything. <laughs>